Well, hello everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Um, welcome very much to this Books on Time Zoom event. Um, I'm Kay Eason from the Lytton Phil, and we are very happy to be in the 11th year of our literary festival, Books on Time, that we run with City Libraries. So I'm very pleased indeed to introduce Selena Todd, our speaker tonight. And this is of Newcastle. Selena is a professor of modern history at St Hilda's College, Oxford. She's a specialist in the history of modern Britain, particularly during the 20th and 21st centuries. Her research focuses on the history of working class life and women's lives. It examines class and gender relations, social mobility, work and education, often by using oral histories and unpublished autobiographies. Her publications include The People, The Rise of and Fall of the Working Class, 1910 to 2010, the myths of social mobility, and the subject of tonight's talk, Tastes of Honey, the making of Sheila Delaney and a Cultural Revolution. Described as a splendid and illuminating book by Kate Kellaway in The Guardian, and by Catherine Hughes in the same newspaper as a subtle and thoughtful, setting out to do more than simply tell Delaney's rags to riches stories, in, as if the Salford bus driver's daughter were some kind of lucky, Winner. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Selena Todd. Thank you very much, Selena. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation and thanks everybody for um for coming out on this cold night to your to your Zoom. Um so I thought I'd begin um with a quick reading from the start of the, the book. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um uh, just to give you a flavour of it, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, about Sheila's life, and then we can hopefully open up to questions. And I'm really pleased to talk about my motivations for writing it and the difficulties <laughs> um, and challenges of writing about her. Um, but I won't do that in the talk. I'll leave that to you to see if, if that's something that you want to talk about. Okay, so in April 1958, 19-year-old Sheila Delaney, the daughter of a Salford bus driver, sent a manuscript to Joan Littlewood, the director of London's avant-garde theatre workshop company. Sheila Delaney's covering note explained to Miss Littlewood that this bundle of thin, closely typed sheets of paper was her first play called A Taste of Honey. A fortnight ago, I didn't know the theatre existed, she claimed. But then a young man, anxious to improve my mind, took me to the opera house in Manchester and I came away after the performance, having suddenly realised that at last, after 19 years of life, I had discovered something that meant more to me than myself. The next day, she wrote, she had borrowed an unbelievable typewriter and set to and produced this little epic. Don't ask me why. I'm quite unqualified for anything like this. The story that Sheila Delaney told to Joan Littlewood was only partly true. Her letter was a typically shrewd attempt to appeal to her audience. In this case, she did so by presenting herself as a naive northern ingenue. Even her signature was embellished. She called herself Sheila Delaney, Sheila spelt with a G-H at the end, the name she will be known by for the rest of this book and my talk in a deliberate rejection of the identity of plain Sheila, spelt the normal English way, from Salford, and the future laid out for her. Sheila G.H. Delaney was a young woman ambitious to escape the life she'd been born into, but she was also determined to tell the stories of the women she left behind. A Taste of Honey was her first attempt, and arguably her best. Sheila's play focuses on Joe a working class teenager who lives in Salford with her single mother, Helen, and who becomes a single mother herself as the result of a brief affair with a black sailor. Jo rages against her fate, but finds solace in her friendship with Jeff, an art student who is keen to make a home for her and the baby. We aren't told what Jeff's sexuality is, but we're led to believe he's gay. The play ends when Helen returns from a brief failed marriage to find Jo's labour pains beginning. A taste of honey grabbed Joan Littlewood's attention. Working class people, if they appeared at all in books, films or plays in the 1950s, were, as the Listener magazine said, comic or loyal or more frequently both. 
For most audiences, these appearances provided the only glimpses of working class life they got. They weren't people one knew. They were people you saw from the tops of buses, Stephen Frears told me. He was then a 17-year-old public schoolboy in 1958, destined for Cambridge and a film career. This situation was slowly changing. John Osborne's play, Look Back in Anger, staged at the Royal Court in London in 1956, was the ripple that quickly turned into a new wave of novels, plays and films about a restless generation of young working class upstarts. But the heroes who wanted adventure tended to be men and women, those who held them back. Sheila Delaney was going to tell and live a very different story. So as I mentioned there, and as I'm sure many of you know, Sheila Delaney was very young when she wrote her first play, A Taste of Honey. She was born in, in November 1938 um, to a bus driver and to a mother who was a factory worker. And she was part of a generation who was central to the kinds of changes that we now know about so well and associate with the years after 1945 and the Labour government that came to power then, the welfare state, near full employment, um, educational opportunities that their parents had never known. So she was part of a generation that experienced and contributed to massive political and social change, both in terms of the political movements of 1968 and after, um, and also in terms of the upward class mobility that many of them experienced and the work that many of them did in professions and occupations that hadn't been open to their parents, whether white collar work, nursing, medicine, the kinds of opportunities that were opened up by the post-war welfare state, teaching most of all in that context, and also to a lesser extent, but still important in the arts, and she was part of that. As I said in the introduction as well, she was also or is often classified as part of a group of writers about the working class, many of them themselves from either working class or lower middle class backgrounds who came to prominence from the late 1950s and through the 1960s. But she was very different from them in focusing on women. Um, her play, as I suggested, really centres on two women, Helen and Jo, and also in focusing on poverty, much of the um, fiction and much of the film about working class life in the 1950s and 1960s was understandably really asking the question, how much has the welfare state, how much of changes since the Second World War really changed lives for, of working class people? Um, and Sheila Delaney was very interested in that question as well. But she, more than most, tended to focus on what hadn't changed. And that was partly because her perspective was so much on women and particularly on women who the welfare state had left behind, such as single mothers. She was very keen to show women in all their dimensions, um, not just the material sides of their lives, but also the emotional side. And as I also suggested earlier, um, the one dimensional character characterizations of working class people on stage and screen was something that she really resented. And when she was interviewed um, in later life, she talked about the influence that the theatre and Beckett had had on her in a positive way as a young woman, but also how much she'd reacted against some of the representations of working class people that she had seen um, growing up in the 1950s. And particularly the idea that they had no interior life and no emotional life. It was very brave of her to focus on single mothers at a time when they were... Um, seen as social outcasts, not so much in their own community, but certainly by the prevailing uh, governments of the time. Um, uh, most welfare benefits, for example, um, stopped being means tested after the Second World War, but most of the benefits that were open to single mothers remained means tested as a way of policing really these women's behaviour, the subtext being that they were promiscuous or feckless at best. By focusing on Helen and Joe. Sheila developed a play and therefore had audiences watching for an hour and a half, two women talking about what they wanted out of life and making clear that they wanted more than children. And by making Helen in particular a sympathetic character, she suggested that that was something that we should find acceptable rather than castigate women for not putting husbands and children always first and centre stage. <laughs> 
So one of the questions for me in um, looking at her life and looking at A Taste of Honey and then what happened to her afterwards was how she came to do this. Um, having been born into a working class home, how she came to leave that behind, but also to create at a very young age, this very um, uh, complex dramatization of working class life that went on to be incredibly popular and is indeed still staged around the world today. And I think that part of the answer resides in the opportunities that, as I've pointed out, her generation had access to. But also Sheila, um, in particular, had um, uh, a way of, a, 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 well, a knack, but also some, some luck in straddling both sides of that kind of post-war divide between how things had been pre-war and how things were post-war. And also the division that still existed in post-war Britain between the people who won through welfare state reform and the people who didn't win. So just to give a couple of examples of that, when she was very young, just before the welfare state, around the time that the welfare state was being forged in the late 1940s, she was very sick for quite a long time and she was sent to a private convalescence home. She didn't have to pay for it because the NHS was just coming in. Um, but she was away from home for, for several months in this convalescence home run by nuns who thought that girls like her weren't really deserving of this kind of care. And that comes up in some short stories that she later writes in the 1960s that are published as a collection called Sweetly Sings the Donkey. And if you're a fan of A Taste of Honey, I can't recommend that collection um, enough. Um, she also straddled that divide between the so-called slums and the new estates that were being built after the Second World War to house people who had previously been housed in inner city terraced housing. Um, as a child, she perhaps wasn't as aware of many of the adults around her of the difficulties of living in very cramped, overcrowded, insanitary housing in the centre of Salford. But she was old enough by the end of the war when her dad returned and the family were moved out to a suburban estate to recognise that this was a real strain, particularly for her mother, um, who found herself um, caring for an invalided man who never really got over his wartime experiences um, in a place where she had no friends. And again, this is something that comes out in some of Sheila's work and a bit later on in a film that she made in the early 1960s about, about her life. Yeah. And almost uniquely, she straddled the divide between the educational haves and have-nots. Um, as many of you will be aware, after the Second World War, a new education act meant that um, every child for the first time had the right to free secondary education in Britain. But the type of school that you went to depended on the result you got in an exam that you took called the 11 plus, with most children, about 80 percent, going to secondary modern schools. Sheila was one of that 80 percent, and she felt that, quote unquote, failure very keenly, she knew that her parents had really wanted her to pass, the, to pass the 11 plus. But because she did well at her secondary modern school, she was unusually transferred to a grammar school at the age of 14, um, but didn't like it as much as the secondary modern. Um, she went from a school where she, she felt castigated as a failure, but had actually had access to quite good art and drama teaching, to going to a school where she felt very lonely, she found it very snobbish, and she also felt like if this was the promised land, it wasn't really much of a promise because the expectations of girls in particular in that bit of Salford and girls more widely at the time were very limited. So she was told by her teachers, you know, that, that if she worked really hard, she could become a teacher. Um, well, that's something that you know, is a laudable profession, but it wasn't what Sheila wanted to do. Um, so she found grammar school very stifling, boring, conservative, and she left at, at, at 17. What she took from all of those experiences was a, a, a real sense of the diversity of working class life. You're living in the inner city or you're living in the suburban estate, you're going to one type of school or another, um, the different types of medical care that were available, you know, just within a generation. And that diversity, I think, really gave her an unusual amount of life experience by the time she came to think about writing. Um, she also took from it a really strong sense of being acted on rather than being consulted about what she wanted to do. And throughout her life, she really resisted being put into any kind of category or herself joining movements, um, because she really um, felt strongly that people should be able to articulate um, and to some extent realise their own aspirations. 
um, without the state or employers or parents or teachers telling them constantly what they had to do. And that was one of the aspects of the post-war or welfare state that she found very difficult, really, that she felt that she was constantly being told, we know what's best for you, and that most of the time it didn't make her terribly happy. Where she did find an outlet for her talents and interests was in Manchester's thriving arts scene. Um, one of the great things that happened after 1945 was that the Labour government did pump a lot more money into the arts. Um, and in Manchester, um, lots of men and some women coming home from the war were thirsty for theatre and got involved in a theatre scene that had really been enlivened in the years between the two world wars by characters like Joan Littlewood and Ewan McCall, um, left-wingers, communists in their case, um, who thought that the arts should be for everybody, not just as spectators, but as participants. And that was still very much continuing in Manchester after the Second World War, although Joan Littlewood had moved her own theatre workshop by then down to East London. But, she, but Joan Littlewood still had a lot of friends of, and contacts in Manchester. And contrary to what Sheila wrote in the letter to Joan, she was already a very uh, experienced theatre goer. She'd already written various sketches um, for local theatre groups. And indeed, one of the local theatre directors was the guy who said to Sheila, you should, you should send your stuff to Joan Littlewood. You know, I think she'd really like it. So she had these kinds of ins. But she was knowing enough to realise as a teenager that there was just beginning to be some kind of currency in the 1950s for being a naive northerner who didn't know much about the arts, but perhaps had a bit of a talent and could shine um, and tell the stories that, that um, uh, theatre types in London didn't yet know about. Um, and she played on that in writing, in writing A Taste of Honey. Um, Joan Littlewood herself was a very supportive director. She was really excited by A Taste of Honey. Um, Theatre Workshop was based um, in Stratford East, still there today, um, and it relied very heavily on local people, um, factory workers, clerks, going along to performances. And Joan thought that this, this production would really, would really appeal to them. The critics completely disagreed. Theatre Workshop was well enough known that they got lots of mainstream critics, BBC, the main broadsheets and so on. And they panned it and said, you know, this is not going to survive. It's going to be an absolute flop. But the BBC has got wonderful um, archive that they recorded from people who went to the first couple of performances, ordinary people who lived locally, who were saying, even though the play was about Salford, not about East London, well, it's about people like us. This is great. You know, really like it. And it was art as well as life. Sheila wrote it as an artistic piece. There's lots of there's lots of song in it. There's lots of um, comic repartee. It's extremely entertaining, but it is also real life. And that really appealed. And as a result of its popularity and Joan Littlewood's backing, it went to the West End. Um, it then transferred to New York's Broadway, and it was made into a film in the early 1960s. It made Sheila's name and it made her fortune. And I think what that tells us is something about the importance of diversity within the theatre scene. We hear a lot today about the diversity of representations within the theatre, but what we're really lacking are the kind of radical theatre companies like Theatre Workshop that actually put plays on by people who are not going to get an in, who don't have the contacts with the big West End theatre companies and so on. Um, it made her name, but she was absolutely uh, panned, Sheila Delaney, this is not Joan, by the media nationally and locally in Salford and by Salford City Council. Um, uh, and, and the attacks came from two directions. Firstly, um, the Daily Mirror, absolutely par excellence at this. Uh, she, was, um, uh, she was getting above herself. Um, this was just what the welfare state led to. Uh, young working class women thinking that they had a right to a national platform and they just produced filth. And then from the other direction, this kind of sense that she was putting dirty laundry out there for anyone to see um, and that it was shameful and that it was an exaggeration. At the time, the Conservative Prime Minister, um, Harold Macmillan, was going around saying that you've never had it so good. There was lots of talk about the fact that um, the post-war period was giving working class people um, the chance of uh, goods and futures that they'd never had before. And here's this young woman putting a play out there which gets popularity, which is basically saying, well, lots of us are still living in the slums, lots of us are still struggling to make ends meet, and lots of us are very discontented and very angry. 
Um, and the local Salford media and the local council um, really came from from that angle and really really attacked her. Um, uh, and and both attacks culminated in the claim that it was really Joan Littlewood who had written the play, not Sheila at all. What's interesting is you can go to the British Library and see the manuscript, the, the manuscript that Sheila Delaney actually sent to Joan Littlewood. And of course, like any good director, Littlewood added to it, embellished bits of it and so on. But in fact, the original manuscript is very much what, what, what you see on the stage. In fact, the main change that Joan made was that the ending, um, when Helen comes back and discovers that Joe is pregnant, in Sheila's version, um, uh, it, it's the case that Helen is quite reconciled to the fact that she realises Joe's going to have a mixed race baby. Um, in Joan's ending, uh, that it, her reaction becomes very racist and was seen as such at the time. I'm not using that word anachronistically. There were critics who who said. Um, that the that the ending was very distasteful and that they couldn't really imagine that you know somebody would go off the deep end in 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 that way um and and they were quite possibly correct um so that was the only major change that w- that was made and and Joan herself recognized that that had been a mistake and the ending was changed back when the play transferred to the west end um so what then happened to Sheila Delaney? She actually died on this day, um, the 21st of November in 2011. And I remember reading the obituaries, which were all very much, oh, you know, one hit wonder, you know, never, never realised her talent. And that was one of the things that whetted my appetite to find out, to find out more about her. And actually, she went on to have quite a successful career. Um, she wrote a second play, The Line in Love, which did quite well. Um, she uh, wrote some screenplays um, in the 1960s and she went on to have some bigger successes that I'll talk about it, uh, in a moment. But it, it's interesting, really, that even by the mid-1960s, she was being written off in the media as a failure, a has-been, as if staging A Taste of Honey was itself a mistake because, look, you know, she didn't really have the talent to see it through. In the process of my research, I spoke to quite a lot of directors who'd worked with Sheila and who've themselves been in the theatre for many years. And it was interesting how many of, of, of them said that they really thought that that treatment was about Sheila being um, a working class woman. Um, and they said, you know, the thing is that w- women in particular never get a second chance in the arts, even today, um, that what happened to her was that she had one hit and then she was expected to make it. Um, uh, but the director, Sean O'Connor, who went on to direct EastEnders and so on, but was a, a, a good friend of, um, of and, and collaborator with Sheila, said to me, you know, the thing is that that's not true of most people. Um, you know, some people have a, a great hit first time around, some people don't. But if you have a network, um, if you have an income, that doesn't matter so much. You know, everybody produces some good work and some not so good work. It's whether you can stay in the theatre um, and, and he said, you know, the, the, the issue for Sheila was that she wanted to branch out. She wanted to write different things. She didn't just want to be stereotyped as a working class playwright who just writes about one thing. Um, and that was very difficult for her. And, and critics were all too, all too ready to dismiss her attempts to do so. She did also struggle um, to write in the 1960s a bit because she became a single mother herself in 1963 when um, her daughter Charlotte, her only child, was born. Um, and she uh, really struggled with the media um, attention around that because she was absolutely vilified and there were um, paparazzi at her door um, demanding to know who the father was um, and uh, really suggesting that she'd written A Taste of Honey in order to play out what she wanted her her own life to become. Um, Now, that's really exceptional. You know, not many women had to go through that in the 1960s. But what is interesting about Sheila's attempt to um, to then live independently as a woman, she was living with a female friend and she had a lot of support from her family, particularly her mother, in bringing Charlotte up, was that she was pursuing something that more and more women were becoming interested in, which was trying to lead a life outside the nuclear family. And by the time she had Charlotte in 1963, there were other women writers from different kinds of class backgrounds, Margaret Drabble, for example, who were beginning to write, Lynn Reed Banks, beginning to write about single motherhood in different kinds of ways, um, both the struggles that it could present to women, but also um, the idea that actually women might have the right to 
um, decide how and when they had and brought up their children. And that actually being independent as opposed to being dependent on a man might in some cases be a more fulfilling future for them. Um, that was something that was very new to explore in literature and the arts. And yet, you know, Sheila Delaney had been doing it several years previously in A Taste of Honey. But it was a struggle um, to live outside convention in that way. Um, and it was definitely something that, that, that caused her some struggles in the 1960s. Nevertheless, she produced some really good work that endures today. Um, she, she, together with the, the film director, Lindsay Anderson, produced a, a very surreal film called The White Bus in the mid-1960s. This was an absolute parody, actually, of Salford City Council. I mentioned that they absolutely hated Sheila's work. Um, in response to it, they did something very peculiar, which was in the early 1960s, they bought a white bus and started giving people tours of Salford's best sites which they said they had to do to get around the terrible reputation that Sheila had had caused the town. Um, their idea of the best sites were things like multi-storey car parks that they'd just built. Um, so she and Lindsay Anderson made this film that was an absolute pastiche of these Salford civic dignitaries going around the town on a bus while a young woman kind of goes quietly mad or not so quietly mad in the background. And then a bit later on in the late 1960s, she teamed up with Albert Finney himself also from, uh, from Salford, to um, write Charlie Bubbles, um, the film he directed and then starred in, which is about uh, a working class lad who becomes um, a, a screenwriter, um, very, very autobiographical. And the film, like The White Bus, includes elements of surrealism, including at the end, Charlie escapes from everything by disappearing in a hot air balloon. It's a really interesting film because it's about social mobility, upward mobility, joining the middle class to some extent, which was the experience of a lot of their generation. But it was also about the struggles with doing that and the difficulties and the disappointments and the frustrations involved in doing that and the distance that it creates between you and the people you've left behind. And the ending is a very interesting one, really, because um, Charlie really can't see a way of reconciling the different parts of himself in the society in which he finds himself hence the hot air balloon just disappearing into a blue sky. But Sheila's influence is also seen in the fact that um, his wife, played by Billy Whitelaw, is also grappling with these struggles, but can't go off in a hot air balloon because she's got to look after their child. So again, yeah, this idea of a difference between the sexes, not very often explored in film at that time, is something that's beautifully and really subtly done in that film. And if you read the notes um, uh, of, of the production process, it's very much Sheila's influence um, that does that. I wanted to emphasise the surrealism as well, because it's something that, that comes out in her later work. Um, and it really is a reminder that working class writers were not just using realism at this point. They were also developing, using and developing and expanding on other kinds of techniques to think about the creative and emotional sides of life. In the 1970s, um, Sheila's work um, really expanded um, because of feminism. The women's liberation movement um, hit the streets of Britain and feminists began to have influence in all kinds of ways. Um, they had to battle for it, but they did succeed in some arenas. So, for example, A Taste of Honey got onto the school curriculum in the 1970s as a direct result of the, the, the campaigns of feminist teachers. And it's remained there ever since. Feminist theatre groups provided a new impetus um, and a new audience for works like A Taste of Honey and other works by women. And that meant there was more appetite generally for Sheila's work. And so as a result, she got some work writing television plays in the 1970s, many of which focus on women's discontent with marriage, the nuclear family, suburban life. Um, and again, often have these surreal twists where you know women step completely outside society in order to try and make a new life. That's very entertaining to watch. It's also a reminder that Sheila herself, who was trying to leave, leave those kinds of conventional constraints behind, couldn't find a way within the society in which she lived of articulating and navigating a different kind of life terribly easily. She tried living with female friends, living alone. She did all kinds of things. But her plays for television really bring out how difficult that was um, and, and, and how hard it was to envisage being able to to live differently, and how hard women tried to do that, nevertheless, um, because having that kind of independence was so important to them. And then 1984 came 
um, what she felt, always felt, was her strongest work, really, um, when she was commissioned to write the screenplay for the film Dance with a Stranger, which tells the story of Ruth Ellis, the last woman to be hanged in Britain. And that took Sheila back to the 1950s, to writing about Ruth's life and about how it was that she came to kill her lover. And in the process, what Sheila really did was to show how the constraints on women and their lives um, in the 1940s and 1950s meant that the only way out of poverty for someone like Ruth Ellis was to was romance, was to find a man to be dependent on um, and to hope to live a romantic dream. And she managed to show the absolute powerlessness um, and frustration and despair um, of a woman who cannot get um, what she wants that way and has no other way um, of, of creating um, an autonomous life for herself that involves some colour and some glamour um, and some emotional fulfilment. Um, Sheila's career declined sadly in the ninety in the late nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, partly because under Margaret Thatcher's government's arts funding dried up, um, particularly for the smaller theatres, which were the ones that tended to pick up on her work. There was also less money around in TV and radio for um, the kind of uh, exploratory and adventurous kinds of um, uh, plays that Sheila liked to write. Um, but And it was also the case that she herself struggled with being um, a single woman as she got older. She had some money worries. Um, she grappled with loneliness. You know, again, a reminder that um, being a pioneer isn't always easy, but it wasn't always really tough either. Um, and she, through some important female friendships, got a new outlet um, in radio on BBC Radio 4, thanks to a new generation of feminist producers and directors in the late 1990s through the 2000s until her death. And she produced new plays that focused very much on uh, women's support networks and how women tried to make the society in which them, they found themselves a more comfortable place for themselves and their children to live. Um, and she did that with great humour and great panache. Um, and what's interesting about those plays and also about her later life, um, it, when she herself established new friendship networks and also remained very close to, um, to her child and her three grandchildren, um, is that although it was hard for her to be a pioneer, she did find a way of living as an independent woman and of really enjoying elements of that and of continuing to depict those ways of life um, on radio. So as I said, she died in um, 2011. And in a way, the book was partly written as a riposte to um, some of those critics. And I hope that I've managed in my talk tonight to, to show that she did do more than just a taste of honey. However, as she herself said to her daughter when she was dying, she recognised that A Taste of Honey was her masterpiece. Um, and I wonder really whether if she'd been a man, she would have been so dismissed by the critics because even just to produce that one play alone um, was really something. It is still shown um, on film and on stage um, around the world today. It recently had a, a major hit with the National Theatre in 2019. Um, her daughter tells me there are plans for a musical in 2025. So the stories that she told then are still resonating um, today. Um, and uh, I'm really glad because I think that she still has a lot to tell us about poverty, about women's lives, about the difficulty um, that many women still face in leading their lives, but also about their aspirations and how they might be realised. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Selena. Um, there, are, there is some time for a few questions. If anybody has anything they'd like to ask, please go ahead. I, I was going to ask Selena actually if um, A Taste of Honey had been translated into any other languages and if it had been performed, how what the reception of the play was in other countries. Yes, really interesting. Yeah, it's been very widely um, translated. And I heard some great stories in the in the press of my research about that. Um, and the different kinds of emphases that have that that, that came out, um, depending on where on where people saw it. So a woman who went on to become a very close friend of Sheila's, actually, who grew up in Czechoslovakia um, in the 1960s, saw it there in the mid 1960s. And she said what was really interesting was that actually 
the independence of the women and um, uh, the sing their single motherhood was not the most shocking thing in Czechoslovakia because whatever the the problems in Eastern Europe and the lack of democracy there, um, many women did many more women than in the West went out to work, and there was um, a degree of there was some degree of acceptance of the fact that women um, should be uh, independent to some extent. So she said, although that was an eye opener. Um, it was nevertheless um, uh, uh, something that they they perhaps accepted more than Jeff's sexuality. And she said for her, what was really interesting about the play um, was seeing Joe and Jeff setting up home together and the idea that this young gay man um, had as much right to uh, uh, express his aspirations um, as, as anybody else at a time when homosexuality was very definitely taboo in that bit of Eastern Europe. I also was lucky enough to meet a woman. I went to talk about um, uh, the research when I was still doing the book um, to uh, some people in America because Sheila herself spent a lot of time in America. You know, it was really the promised land in the 1960s. And when the film was made, it was made in Hollywood. So she spent some time there. So myself and Charlotte, Sheila's daughter, were lucky enough to go to uh, L.A. Um, to meet up with various folk who had known Sheila um, uh, in about, I think it was 2015. And weirdly enough, the bed and breakfast that we were staying in, it was run by um, uh, an American guy um, and uh, and his wife, who we didn't meet for several days because she was on a trip. And when she came back, she came rushing into um, the living room and said, you're researching Sheila Bellany. And she had grown up in Israel on a kibbutz. And she said it was really dull. Um, she was in her uh, mid-teens when the film came out of A Taste of Honey in the early 1960s. And she said there was nothing on this kibbutz. We were just in the desert and it was really macho. Um, and she said, I just wanted to get out. And she said, I always thought, um, you know, I wanted to go to France because, you know, I'd heard about Simone de Beauvoir and I wanted to be on the left bank in Paris. And she said, and then I saw this film of A Taste of Honey. And somebody said to me, you know, it's by this teenage girl. And she said, I just wanted to go and live in Salford. So she set off for Salford, but she had to get a boat. So she went via America and she said, and then I met this guy and I've never left L.A. I said to her, you know, there are people in Salford who've swapped places with you, but she didn't believe me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Has anybody else got a question? No, oh, everybody's very shy. Sorry, um, I've got a sort of question, um, unless I've picked it up wrongly. Um, I mean, it's fascinating, and I remember the film as a child, um, well, as a child, goodness, a young person. Um, I'm just interested to know how she'd gone from what I'd assumed would have been success into having financial difficulties. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and she... I think part of the issue about having success that early is that you don't you don't really learn to look after yourself. You know, she she um, she 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 was underage because she was under 21 at the time and the age of majority was 21 when she had all the success with a taste of honey. So Joan Littlewood became her guardian um, and Sheila hated that. And in the end, threatened to go to court. You know, again, this kind of idea of I don't want people telling me what to do. I've been brought up by people who just keep saying, you know, we, we want the best for you. We know what's best for you. Um, she wanted her independence. So in the end, she got it. And the first thing she did was to buy a sports car. She couldn't drive. Um, so she had to give that away. Um, and of course, she was this young woman, suddenly with all of this, this money and all of this opportunity, but not really any sense of how to go about making the most of it. And her every move, of course, was being watched by the media. So she went through phases of trying to shock them, you know, and being terribly extravagant. And then phases of... Um, of, of really kind of holding the purse strings very tight. What she found really difficult to do, I think, um, was to find any kind of happy medium between the kind of film star lifestyle that she'd aspired to. But when she got it, of course, you know, you can't just, you can't live like just buying sports cars all the time. It might make you happy for a while, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily make you happy all the time. And what her mother had done, because she really liked, um, her dad died suddenly just after A Taste of Honey um, was was made, was was produced. But she um, she remained very close to her mum uh, and to her brother who stayed in Salford. And she associated her mum's house with home. Um, but 
she had seen her mother make this home by being very self-sacrificial and she knew she didn't want to do that. So, um, and friends, when I talked to her friends for the book, one of the things they said was she found it really difficult to make a home for herself. She had a beautiful Georgian house in North London, but it was always a bit ramshackle and the milk was always sour because she didn't want to become this, you know, this housewife, this self-sacrificial mother. But equally, she couldn't really find a way of being anything else. She didn't want staff. She didn't come from the kind of background where having other people in the house like that made her comfortable. How do you do it? In a way, it's a very exceptional dilemma. But actually, it's it, in a different way. It's a dilemma that hit quite a few women who, through dint of going to university or moving into white collar work, found themselves leading very different lives from their own mothers in the 1960s and 1970s, which is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you make a comfortable, a comfortable life without then going into the kind of older middle class um, tradition of employing staff, you know, and, and, and doing all of that kind of thing. So it's something that she, that she personally really, really, really struggled with. In terms of the money worries, um, it, she never really had any, I mean, she left a lot of money when she died but she just couldn't manage it. And so all the time throughout her life, she was oscillating between this extravagance and then this kind of sense of, I better remember where I came from. You know, I'm probably skin. You know, I should, you know, immediately. She ended up moving to a really tiny one, one up, one down in Yorkshire towards the end of her life because she was so convinced that she was living in poverty. Um, the sad thing is she wasn't. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, if, if nobody else has a, a question, I'd just like to draw the evening to a close. And thanks, Lena, on behalf of the Lytton Phil for taking part in this Zoom event as part of our book festival that I mentioned before. Uh, and to thank our audience tonight for attending. Um, so we do appreciate everything you've said. It's been really interesting, great insight into the life of such an important writer and, and uh, character, really. And uh, many thanks indeed, Selena. Thank you. And thank you all for giving up your time. I um, really enjoyed it. Good. Thank, thank you. you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.